Coming up in today's Idea Space podcast. I never show fire, floods and fear, you know, at the beginning of my presentations or whatever, because my assumption is people know that already and their heads are in the sand. And if I start with that story, then they're just going to stick their heads even deeper in and won't engage. You heard the phrase of gigacorns? They're companies that will take a billion tonnes of CO2 gas out of the atmosphere per year. They're not, they don't exist yet, but we need them to. Welcome to the Idea Space podcast. I'm Ben Hartley, head of Idea Space. Idea Space is a community of entrepreneurs, founders and their teams, many of them working alongside each other in one of our three offices based in and around Cambridge. Our members share knowledge, experience and expertise to help themselves and others in their high impact venture creation. In this Startup Stories episode, we're talking with Leo Raymond. Leo is the founder and CEO of Eden Lab and the former CEO at Grey Consulting, a growth and transformation agency where he led corporate innovation and transformation programs. Leo has a great depth of experience in planning and executing marketing, advertising and brand strategy in global brands, and he now uses that experience to help invent and reinvent companies for a post-carbon world. He finds, designs and puts together new business models, products and services that actively reduce emissions and harm to people and nature, while still generating revenues. All this is done under his sustainability, innovation consultancy and venture studio, Eden Lab. Right, well, um, Leo, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Ben. Yeah, no worries. Um, and before we delve into uh, your story and how you founded mm -hmm. uh, Eden Lab, mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about what it actually does? Yeah, that's the killer <laughs> question. Um, Eden Lab is a sustainability innovation company. Um, and sometimes, depending on who I'm talking to, I might also describe it as a green growth consultancy. And... We'll talk later about that, I'm sure, but green growth is an, is an interesting phrase, but it's also quite a politicized one. So, um, you know, I choose my moments for how to describe it. But broadly speaking, we're mainly helping companies to, well, we are helping companies to take part in the great transition that's happening in the economy and society towards a, a much more sustainable or regenerative world that we need to move towards. So how do you do it? How do you get there? Um, big companies find it really hard. Small companies find it easier. Startups should be baked baked from that in the first place, and then we can talk about that as we go. But um, mm. yeah, that's and, so, our job. and so, are you um, primarily a venture builder or accelerator or a consultancy or a collective of experts? Or can I tell you? In, I'll tell you in a year's time. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, okay. well, we, I start. I resigned about a year ago, so and started the company in earnest, really, you know, generating revenue at the beginning of the year. At the moment, we are primarily consulting bigger organizations and then I'm advising startups and small ones on the side including some from from Cambridge actually through the carbon 13 program particularly as you might have heard of right yeah absolutely it'd be good to touch on on that in, yeah. in a bit actually yeah. um so we, we'll talk a little bit more about that because um obviously a lot of our listeners are uh entrepreneurs and founders themselves yeah. so it'd be interesting how you um, obviously started Eden Lab, um, and then we'll go on and, and talk a bit about more about the, um, the sorts of things that you do mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. um, a lot of startups or entrepreneurs that might be listening to this, how they might be able to yeah. also start that change. As you said, it should be baked into um, to, to startups, you know, derogate. it should be there anyway. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, but let, let's rewind the clock back mm. a touch and, and just mm. see how your, um, how your story starts. Yeah. So you started your career in a more all-encompassing marketing role um, at an agency. I believe you covered a whole um, Volkswagen account, um, which uh, it's clearly a big account. So how yeah. did you transition from a degree in modern history from Oxford to a, 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 a role in a key or a key, an influential role, I should say, in marketing and advertising? Yeah, how funny. I mean, I was thinking on this recently, like, you know, you expect to leave university with a strong plan. I think young people these days are more organized than I was. This is the, the mid 90s. I had no love of that or interest in advertising at all. <laughs> I wanted to do the communication of history, but that just mm. isn't really a thing. <laughs> I worked at the National Trust for a while, and that was quite boring. You had to wait till some old dude died before you could take it anyway, in those days. So, um, no, my, you know how kind of careers are, are wiggly things, you know? Yeah. Or maybe you like, you like to think they're very progressive and well planned, but mine certainly wasn't. I don't think people's really are. But um, I took my first job, which was in media sales, which is now done by an algorithm, by the way, mm. selling ad space, um, because it was a big glass building and my friend was in the law firm next door. And that's pretty much, 
you know what drove me to, and I was desperate <laughs> to get out <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and find something else. Yeah. Um, I suppose though that I'd always been quite fascinated by, particularly in history, um, propaganda and communication and how stories are controlled and told and how they get into culture. So probably marketing was a a natural evolution yeah, of that more, passion more than anything more obvious. else. Yeah. respectively when you look yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, so uh, I guess how important is your background in marketing um, in helping your current role? I mean, it seems mm. at face value probably very important because you're having to you're having to tell a story and, and almost sell something. You wouldn't think you would have to um, with the, the, the sort of massive impact of climate change. Yeah, um, you'd be surprised actually. But yeah, so how, how important has that background been? And, and it's re in, hugely, and I think it's also been a source of kind of anxiety, if I can be honest with you. I'll tell you why. So I was doing work helping big companies figure out how they could articulate their sustainability story better. And that's fine, and we did it with due diligence, and we were careful around avoiding greenwash. But I just felt we were painting the deck chairs green on the Titanic, you know, for this big <laughs> food company. Good to know. Well, it was, they were green, but they were still on the Titanic. Yeah. And nothing had fundamentally changed. And about that time, I was doing an online course with Cambridge, um, with the um, Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, which we call CISL. Uh, and I realized that the need for something a bit more fundamental was absolutely was just crucial. So I couldn't be doing the green debt chairs anymore. But I also saw, and this is the interesting thing, I think, that there was an enormous, a, a gaping kind of hole between, on one hand, people who understand sustainability, people who are from an environmental science background, climate scientists, engineers and chemists and biologists who are, you know, and geographers are going to be at the forefront of the next, the next big change. And anyone who really understood how to shape aspiration and behavior. And there just wasn't enough of a connection between those two, maybe you don't call them industries or schools or mindsets or talent, whatever. There just was a gap. And that's what Eden Lab has been sort of designed specifically to kind of bridge that space, which has been very successful. But I can see why marketing, demand generation, you know, selling, consumption, those things seem antithetical to sustainability. Mm. And I think most of the activists who I respect and who do an important job would never look at the marketing person as a, or as a skill set that would be utilized or useful or part of the part of the future. But I disagree with them. Mm. Um, and so we can talk about the model of the theory of change. People talk about a lot in sustainability about, about mine. Um, and actually I think that unless we can reshape and redirect people's current behaviors, the mm. things they currently buy, the things they currently value, we're not going to make it. Um, and we might wait 10 years for a great revolution to happen and um, we'll all be knitting our own underpants out of Hessian grown in Wales in our silo. Uh, and maybe that is coming. Mm. Maybe it is. Uh, but I'm not really prepared to wait for that to happen. So I thought rather than wait for the system to break, which it might, I thought I might be able to try and bend it now. Mm. Hence and, bridging those two things. And, and the, the, the leap, so you worked your way up through the, the ranks at, um, at Grey, mm. um, London Large Agency. That's right, yeah. Um, uh, to the role of CEO at Grey Consulting. Yeah. Um, what made you make, or, or what made you want to make that leap to start your own venture? Because there's one thing making yeah, change yeah. from within an organization. There's another sort of leaping out and saying, okay, I'm going to do this on my own. So many things drive you there, don't they? It's kind of like butterfly wings, I guess, beating. I'd never thought of myself as a true entrepreneur. I had discovered this phrase, intrapreneur, that people sometimes talk about like you've done stuff inside companies which is all the kind of fun of it but none of the risk <laughs> and, not, and frankly none really none of the excitement and true yeah. jeopardy either and you were, so you're crazy enough to do the other one uh, the yeah. entrepreneur but I've done that a few times and I thought and in fact I've done four years in, during COVID as well where we started this we tried to upstream the strategy advice you get from a creative agency company um, successfully actually to the tune of several million dollars and, and global reach so I thought I'd given it a go once why not try it on the basis of having made lots of mistakes in that one, they try and do it again and make some different mistakes, I suppose. Mm. And what, I know this is a very broad question, but mm. what, what were the main challenges for you uh, as essentially the founder of a, as a, of a startup company? Well, it's not like just one, I wasn't just wandering into a well-designed, well a well-articulated space. Mm. So 
I guess I could have gone into AI for creative development of advertising copy or something, and it would have been a bit more straightforward, I think. Um, I might have known who the buyers were. Whereas in this, in this instance, I'd spotted the space and I was trying to articulate that opportunity in a way that people would engage with and understand. Mm. But it's not like I've got a, a very, I have now, I think, but initially at least, not a very predefined buyer or customer. Um, it was kind of a mission that I th believe would, would pay off. And I wasn't sure over what time frame we'd start to see the results, really, whether it would be an instant hit or a long-term burn. Actually, it's been, I've been really, really amazed by the pickup in the last, the last six months I've been doing it. Mm. Um, so it is, it is new. I sometimes worry about, I think it's new. It's, I sometimes worry about this idea that you're the only person in a space because that, does that reveal there is a market at all? Um, and I'm beginning to see people, but I'm beginning to see more people doing what I'm trying to do, more people training from my background in the space that, you know, sustainability. So there's definitely the sense of, I think I was early in, but not necessarily the only one. Mm. That's probably not the only thing that was a challenge, but it's certainly one that made me, you know, I thought about pretty hard. Mm. Well, I mean, a lot of our, uh, our founders at um, Idea Space have a, an amazing piece of technology and not right. necessarily know the market. It's It's often very novel, so, yeah, um, understanding if there is a, even indeed a market out there is, is a challenge yeah. for them too. And I'm still thinking about, and I'm, I'm going to try and stay open as long as I can. I don't want to fossilize too quickly, although efficiency forces you to do that, doesn't it? But mm. I really want to, will it be a technology? I, at the moment, it's a philosophy. It's a strategic consulting advisory. It's coaching and mentoring. It's communication. It's training. But it might well become... I've been doing some uh, big work on some data, a big data set of putting together at the moment. So it might well become an analytics function, I think. Mm. I'd like to stay open to what happens because I also, it's, I guess like digital technology was particularly, and still is, it's an ever evolving frontier. So maybe you can't fix too hard on what your solution is. You might have a, a need you're solving, but maybe your solution changes. And I'd like to think it's the same in what we're doing. So in the sense of, what will climate change and society's increasing reaction and maybe anxiety around it bring in terms of how society and business operates? We're, you know, it's not clear yet, actually. But I have some strong senses that we can talk about that. But um, mm. I'm definitely pitching something for what I see as coming rather than what's necessarily here. Yeah. And did you, um, when you had made that leap, and as you've said, you'd, you'd had experience before, mm. um, did you... Uh, I was going to say, need anyone else, to, uh, as in a, a co-founder or a, a team uh, yeah, at that no, point, or is it a case of... No, I just got going, to be honest, yeah. definitely bootstrap. I do have um, people working for me now and about to hire another one. And No, I didn't really... I would like to have had a co-founder because I think it would have been reassuring, but I just didn't bump into the right person at the right time. I'm still actually open to it, um, mm. definitely, in terms of bringing people in. I just wanted to get on with it, though, you know? Yeah. And... Um, yeah, I mean, I security just, comes from having someone that you can bounce off for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and the well, the journey is so different for for, for all founders. We we, we get founders um, with us that wish they hadn't and wish they'd gone. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, partly because they you, you can find a, a, a sort of a, a a friend who has who shares the same beliefs and the same aspirations for the company and everything else. But then you realise actually you, you don't need two of you with the same mm. beliefs and mm. the same mm. um, um, skill set or, or personalities, <clears throat> that, yeah, you actually need someone who is utterly different to you, who yeah. brings something completely different. And, mm. and often looking at it in terms of, a, you know, what do I lack in skills? Uh, and then filling, filling it from that side. Yeah, that seems more sensible. Um, so it must be pretty hard for you leaving the security of a successful um, job to... to go out on your own was there any impact if you don't mind me asking on your own sort of personal life yeah no life absolutely or? and that's it's good I think it's important to have that conversation because it's quite easy to I was very seduced by the idea of being an entrepreneur and starting up I'd always look I used to sit in my corporate job and then we'd go out for coffee and we'd look at the people in the we work and I was deeply jealous inside but it's easy to be jealous of the sort of upside less so of the downside if I so I'm happy to be fr fairly frank about it really which is I, so I'd started in September properly on my own. I've been through phases of deep, deep anxiety, like properly soul searching, at, um, wake in the night type stuff, which I know is, I had it before actually, when I had the responsibility of 450 people's salaries on my head. Um, 
but it doesn't go away. And it, I found I manifested it very physically. Mm. I, this is, a, I mean, this is because, you know, I don't know. I thought I like the idea of being honest and vulnerable in these. Makes for a more interesting conversation, to be honest. But, um, and and uh, you know, partly because a large number of people that would be listening to this who are going through a similar yeah. journey know exactly what you're talking about. So I'll about. tell you, this is a quite sick story, silly story, not sick, silly. Every time I had a baby, I put weight on. <laughs> just, I just did. Like, I get anxious and I eat. That's my thing, eating anxiety. And I didn't realize that having Eden Lab is like having a baby. <laughs> it's like so I put weight on. I'm losing it now. As you can see my spelt <laughs> listeners, I'm You're extremely listen, he slim. He incredible. He looks amazing. <laughs> I you should have seen me six months ago. Um, but that's my, that's my cross to bear as far as this, stuff, as this stuff goes. And then kind of slowly realizing that. And then, but I guess the, Throughout that anxiety and worry, I also had this incredible excitement as a kind of honeymoon period that I'm sure others have found. Then there was a kind of a realization and dawning of the challenge period. And then there's now there's kind of something a bit, a bit calmer. And I'm sure there'll be more to come, different waves. But where I've begun to see that, oh, my God, this is a thing. People are really engaging with it. Mm. And, and even if it isn't, the, the, my depth of sort of alignment between what I'm good at, what I think the world needs... A sense of purpose, frankly. I, mean, I don't like that P word because it's so overused, but a sense of personal purpose, let's say. Mm. That alignment is incredibly fulfilling and it cr creates a sense of meaning and self-worth that, that perhaps I didn't really have. I guess that's why I left the other world. It didn't really... I worked in a big, big advertising and marketing group. It was like, I think, 150,000 people worldwide, WPP. Wow. Oh, but it wasn't. But, you know, you're kind of at sea in this enormous network and you can be bobbed along and it, you just sort of... I had fun there, but but I wasn't really doing something that really mattered, and it didn't really matter to me. And I know it sounds crazy, but I, I know I was taking some money home and stuff. I know I was looking after teams, and we had good times, and I helped people develop, and I you know I, I was rewarded by that. But it didn't really matter. And I think staring out the window like we all did during bits bouts of COVID or whatever else and lockdowns did make me wonder what the hell it was all about. Mm. Um, and also because I think if you've worked in, let's say you've worked in some amazing piece of technology and you're genuinely removing friction in the world and making the world a better place, that might, that might be fine. But I was working in marketing and advertising and I'd begun to realize that sheer consumption driving might not necessarily be something that I'd want to sort of look in my kid's eyes and feel proud of myself for in the longer term. So, but then the question arose, what are you going to do with your skill set then? Because hence repurposing it really. Mm. Mm. Well, that's, um, it's, really refreshing to have, have such a sort of frank analysis of that that journey because um i think many will really appreciate that one the difficulties of mm -hmm. it and the anxieties because there are when you when you step out on your own the security blanket goes and you're left knowing that you're the one that did it you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, right. it's like <laughs> you know if it, if it goes wrong it's like oh god I, you know i made the decision to go and do it so and there's also one of you know a, friends and family or anyone else who knows you are doing that journey you, yeah. it feels even more pressure to sort of succeed i think it, it's interesting on the other side of the atlantic it, it sort of feels that 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 um process of uh you know it might even be f business of uh, sorry starting a business and failing and then doing another one and failing and that that's looked in with sort of high regard you've earned your stripes in a way and yeah. then for us we put undue pressure on ourselves because we feel that there's some that's interesting analysis on you know, we failed, that's it. You know, we're a yeah, failure, but yeah. elsewhere people consider the that. The self-worth side of it, or, you know, um, or rather how you concerned about your perception in the eyes of others, is, is interesting. I've been working against that my whole life, really. I haven't felt that bit so much. Well, I did come to a conclusion that if it all goes wrong, I'll probably find another job or start another one. Yeah, it's funny, yeah. But, but you have to get there through a sense of, I don't know, feeling your way through the pain to come out the other end. Yeah, I think you gain a sense of confidence with it. Yeah. But as I was saying, I, I know that people appreciate that. It's but nice that to, feel ali to feel alive, though. And that, I know that sounds mm. a bit ridiculous, really, but you can kind of do the same old thing without thinking that day after day after day after day. Yeah, months and but years past. Also, exactly. And also, by the way, like to live a life where you think you might not have fulfilled your potential would be kind of a pretty s sad place to end up, I mm. thought. So, well, I think now. Mm. And, and the um, the... The cause that there could be a, a, a greater one at the moment that we're, we're seeing every day, um, yeah. the um, the effects and impacts of, of what we're doing to the to the planet. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So I read this thing, and you know how you sort of I was searching for what to do next, and it took me a while. And also, I took I maybe took eighteen months to build up the courage to do this jump. By the way, but I I um 
I read this blog post one end of a Christmas holidays that was something, and it was American, and it was something like, what problem in the world most deserves your talent thrown at it? Which is a kind of overly aggrandizing, arrogant, I don't know, in a way, but it did sort of, it was thinking about that question that made me think, oh, maybe I shouldn't just be, you know, selling more cars. Mm. Oh, yes, and then climate and everything else that came with that. Um, can we talk a, a little bit about the, the course you took at yeah. uh, Cambridge, yeah. uh, the Business um, Sustainability Leadership course? Yeah. Um, how did that course help motivate you to make the positive change? Did, did you do did you do the course first? Uh, yeah, or? I was. I knew I was planning to move on. Pretty much, I hadn't actually pulled the trigger on it, as it were. But um, the course gave me the confidence and the urgency to do it. And I often say this to people, which is what that course did is it it sort of helps you look into the abyss. And once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. It's a and a lot of people go through that same experience on on that Cambridge sustainability course. And there are probably others doing the same thing, but it's quite hard to kind of brush something away when you've actually looked into it in detail and understood the nature of the systemic nature of the challenge we face. And that <laughs> ignorance is bliss. I realize that, you know, either don't look at it at all or engage and take action, but there's not really a comfortable middle ground where you've looked at it and you're not doing anything about it. Mm. So in a way that course is, I'm sure that's why it was developed and designed. It's cleverly influencing cohort after cohort of people coming through i noticed my network on linkedin which is one way of seeing it you know increasingly people are coming through and then the things i've written about it means others are taking it on it's like it's a bit like i did history so i've often got these in analogies in my mind but i feel like the enlightenment or protestantism or some big shift in perception in society happens in dribs and drabs and then suddenly it gains a huge momentum behind it and I think it's the same I was really really I'm still heartened by the number of people firing into it from different life stages different backgrounds different verticals different roles in companies it's completely there's no like a certain kind of person re, and it is a retraining or rethinking course really they don't just tell you that when you do it but it really is um, it's reassuring to know that a lot of people are thinking about this and engaging with it mm. we should feel good about that we need a lot more, uh, but that's happening. Mm. I'm, I'm interested, does the um, sustainability transformation movement or, or those associated with it, um, do they struggle to communicate um, how, business, how people and businesses should make a change? Entirely. That's why I did what I'm doing. It's kind of rem remarkable. I think there's a bunch of reasons why. So... <laughs> I think if, you're, if you've worked hard as an activist at the far end and you've been doing it for a long time and no one would listen to you, you know, the, stuff, the warnings about climate change were kind of around in the 70s and 80s, mm. but no one go down really. Um, and things just accelerated since then, frankly. And I think that can lead you to a place where you're very anti, you see a lot of anti-business sentiment um, and you see a lot of, obviously therefore anti-marketing, anti all that stuff. I have this very simple thing, which is 3.2 billion people work for companies worldwide. Maybe, may, many of them very small. What, are we going to use what they do during the day as part of the solution, or are we going to ignore it? I think we have to find ways to engage businesses. Mm. There's an awful lot of, there's been an awful lot of cynicism, there's been an awful lot of cover up, there's been a lot of pretense, but that's beginning to change. And I, so my whole thought was we need to engage that business world with this challenge. And then the question is, how do you do it? Because of that, that makes me, I think, an eco-capitalist or maybe an eco-social capitalist, it's a, which is a dangerous phrase because it certainly to call yourself a capitalist in this world is uh, it's asking for a kicking, really. <laughs> yeah. Because the system, the capitalist system, is perceived to be broken and it kind of is in lots of ways. Or maybe it's just not working in the way that it optimally might, which would be more, more my view. But I think we have to find ways to engage business. Otherwise... Nothing will change fast enough. Companies have the reach, they have the influence, they have the sophistication, they have the expertise, they have the money, they have the technology. What if we could use it? The flip of it also is that how do you approach them to tell them that? I'm, I'm more carrot than stick, I decided. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason for that is that if I, I, never, I never show fire, floods and fear you know, at the beginning of my presentations or whatever because... My assumption is people know that already and their heads are in the sand. And if I start with that story, then they're just going to stick their heads even deeper in and won't engage. 
And instead, I flip it completely. And so I never show those charts of rising temperature. What I say is, here, look at the rising investment in climate tech or clean tech. Or look at the growth of secondhand apparel. Or look at the investment in plant proteins or alt proteins, for example. So I show the, I try and show them through the lens of, this is a trend. You're a business person. You know how to get on top of trends. Get on top of this one. I, I've got a piece um, I'm developing for Management Today magazine, which is all about sustainability is the new digital don't get left behind really is the sentiment of that piece so i use i use it that way as the story to engage big and small businesses mm. and then the plan is to and then what we've been doing is making big companies more sustainable and sustainable companies bigger because there's different ways of achieving the outcomes we set ourselves a goal of um, removing five million tons of greenhouse gas from the atmosphere over five years that's the equivalent of about 5 million flights from London to New York, wow. business class, or it's, I think it's a million average American cars for a year off the road, to give you a sense of the scale. But I wanted to have something that felt unreachable mm. and scary. And then it leads you to two very simple conclusions. Either you have to work with massive companies where you can make a small change to all their customers, so Unilever, for example, some of my clients, um, or work with amazing, brilliantly thought through startups typically in climate tech or other spaces like that where one exponential advance could make a huge difference right um, and i need to do a lot more on that second part the first part's been easier from a money-making point of view to be yeah. honest from my experience but um that's the model for the company and when you talk about money making and um, to make real change and impact um do we have to make the commercialization of sustainability sort of okay and acceptable is that an issue yeah, I was gonna really say, is, it is an issue yeah yeah because we've got some kind of question it's, it's very difficult um making the commercialization of research acceptable in academic institutions or environments um so i'm guessing that might be the same yeah in, in and you get you mix you meet different um attitudes in this space i think commercializing sustainability seems like the wrong thing to do except that cambridge course is all about business sustainability leadership like how do you turn companies into more sustainable vehicles or vehicles of sustainability so i think it is that there is a there is um someone used a phrase with me the other day which is describing internal sustainability people in companies as activists in lanyards i thought it was quite a funny <laughs> quite a funny the problem with that though is that those people don't get a hearing with the decision makers because they're coming at it through you should and kind of trimming around the margins they don't really yet they're not very good i don't believe and this is very unfair so apologies if you're one of them but they're not very good at selling a vision of how the company could still be around in 20 years time or 10 years time what that might look like i i came from an advertising background and the the one skill we honed was pitching i mean that was we were we are very people who do that are very very good at it because you do it wrong loads um and you see what works but the ability to pitch a vision for what your resilient company future might look like in a in a changed climate environment or how you might be still around in 10 years in a dominant player in a net zero economy or a post-carbon world requires someone who can sell a dream and a vision. And I don't see much of that. I see, and when I talk to sustainability people in corporate jobs who are being hardworking, and I, I have such respect for them. But when you tell them the vision story that captures the board's attention, you see their eyes open genuinely widened actually and I think that's because of bringing a different set of skills to the challenge probably it was true in I was thinking about this like the digital you know back in the days of like is it Gerard Lanier and people who are like properly at the beginning of um the internet they were kind of radical and then other skills arrived into the space and it became very normalized and mainstreamed I think the same thing's happening and that isn't necessarily a smooth journey to be lumpy and bumpy on the way, but um, mm. I don't see there being any alternative anyway. Mm. Um, you, you touched before about um, startups where obviously for you and your business, you need to look at your own revenue and the, mm. it's going to be slightly easier if you're working for those big companies that have deeper pockets. Um, but with regard to startups or how to make change at the other end, um, do you do you have any sort of young companies or small startups yeah. that you're working with at the moment? Yeah, I mean, typically, I've sort of been choosy and gone for those that are working in, mainly going for supporting people working on decarbonisation or sustainability um, missions. And then actually what's kind of funny is what they need most from 
me and my team is is actually more around how do we tell our story, how do we engage with people, what's the right way to to inspire and excite, which is actually kind of classic. Frankly, it's classic marketing and branding, really, um, but with a literacy around around climate and, and mm. sustainability that's, that's interesting. But many of the and this is you'll have seen this, of course, many times. And I know that I'm sure Idea Space are all over this, but the ability to tell the story in a way that engages people. I think you've had people talk about this on your podcast before. It's so overlooked. And actually, it, it seems easy when you're in it, but actually, people get it wrong all the time. I saw an amazing, it was part of, um, you know, Canopy. It's part of the Cambridge um, University Ethic, and they're supporting climate tech startups. And they've been given the lessons in how to do the tell your personal story way of selling, which they had that down. But I saw one guy who was talking about um, some amazing new consumer product that he created that replaced getting rid of cars basically I won't name him because it's kind of embarrassing the best slide was the last slide in his deck where he showed beautiful images of the product he'd created he spent the whole time talking about the features of the technology not showing the beautiful outcome mm -hmm. this, is, this is a problem we I told him the put time. the last slide first yeah. but that's entirely a brilliant um, example of what people don't figure out somehow, I don't know. Yeah, and we get a lot of technical specialists and yeah. academics forming startups, and it is all about, as you said, the the function of the, the product itself, and you want to say, you know, shout about the, the change that it's gonna make, or the problem that it's solving. Or yeah, or the benefit to the, the, the end person you're trying to reach. Yeah. And by the way, it wasn't just, not just startups and you know, research and technicians and technologists that, that, that have that challenge, it's that, I saw in every company I ever worked with. And I think it's sort of a human cognitive bias around priming. Mm. The thing that's near to you sort of dominates your field of vision. And then you can't imagine it from the outside. And quite a lot of what, in fact, what we've, I've been doing my whole career is bringing an external viewpoint to people who can't see it just because right. they're so close to it. Whereas we were always more distant in a way. Oh, really yeah. interesting. Um, so how might you find um, those startups to, to work with? Um, do you, do they come to you, or is yeah. I guess it's quite early enough for you that you're still selling what what it is that you do. But yeah, where would you normally find them? I've been I've been very lucky to do connections with Carbon Thirteen that I mentioned in in, in Cambridge, um, and that's been the main place actually where I put myself down as a domain expert for nothing, pro bono by the way. And then people just started reaching out to me that way around. Then you get a reputation for it, I suppose. Mm. Um, quite fun to go there's such a and such a number of people doing tech pitches in london particularly where I, I live and and um so it's quite easy to bump into people in that in that world and then see how they're getting on i'd like to i think going forward it would be smart to be a bit more choiceful about and a bit more um directional in choosing those that we think have significant potential to help at least us meet our five million mission you know five million tons of co2 mission um that would probably be more useful. Here's an example. So I was helping out with um, a firm doing startup, doing climate education and sustainability training for companies. That's their model of change. That will train, will train every employee worldwide. And then once they understand the world differently, we'll move forward. I think that's probably true. How, how, how likely that is to take 5 million tons out of the atmosphere versus someone coming up with an amazing technology around um, carbon sequestration? I, I don't know. I've got a thing called Carbon Tunnel Vision. Have you heard of that? No. Well, it's kind of interesting, and so I'm just admitting to it on the podcast <laughs> in case anyone knows, but it's this idea that you're so obsessed by removing or dealing with the carbon dioxide problem or the greenhouse gas problem that you fail to see the broader system, systemic problem in which it is embedded. I'm just admitting it now. So, because I'm so focused on that, but the truth of it is is that um, poorer communities are hit harder and suffer most so you can't dis di divorce carbon from social impact for example mm. particularly in uh, developing markets or developing world so anyway i just mention it because more broadly it's about sustainability we're doing some work with the fa at the moment okay. it's an amazing client to win in a project to be working on mm. and the project is to help the fa inspire the twenty thousand football clubs in the uk to decarbonize except it should probably be more than that because for sure, it, a club has energy that it uses for the clubhouse and lights and stuff on the grounds. Um, but it also has grounds and fields and, or lack thereof, in fact, green grass that's kind of a monoculture, which probably should be more biodiverse. And so suddenly you can begin, and there's lots of water, and suddenly you can see the broader 
environmental footprint is more than just their carbon emissions. So mm. it's just an example of needing to think more broadly about what we do. Mm. I don't know why I've taken you down this. No, no, it's, it's fascinating. No, it's, it's all <laughs> incredibly interesting. And I'm wrestling with my yeah, wrestling with it myself really. Um, with regards to where you might go in the future. And I guess I'm thinking in terms of those younger startups as well, mm. as in not age of the founders, but in, in terms of there being early stage startups and spin outs. Um, would you at some point look in the future to finance, maybe p- yeah. partner up with um, um, a, a VC or uh, yeah, an institutional investor to, to actually start financing companies and running it more like an accelerator program itself. I know you've, with Carbon 13, you've, you've yeah, got experience I think, that. I think that's definitely on on my agenda for the the future. And, and frankly, probably now, really, in a sense. I, just, I, don't know the, I don't know the world of money very mm. well. So I'd be lying if I said I knew how to be a VC. But I have an investment thesis for sure. I mean, I invested my life in it. Um, also, by the way, and this is something I, you know, I will share with you, but I think we all look at these. There's a kind of... Um, I think that the stuff we see about climate on telly and in the papers and online and stuff, it often is um, a bit like a boiling frog, you know, that boiling frog story. It's kind of the temperature's heating up, literally, and you don't really realise it's happening. There's drip, drip, drip news feed, and it begins to just be like, the weather's just a bit screwy, and, but here I am carrying on doing what I'm doing. I actually think that... And then you see these kind of changed charts for temperature, and they're often like glide paths. They look like glide paths, up or down, but they're glide paths. I don't think it's going to be like that. I think what's going to, this is my theory, is that the, and it's not entirely without scientific basis, but that the, there are a bunch of system change effects that are going to happen, which means that climate change will be like steps rather than a gentle slope, potentially. Um, and why that's important is I suspect that we, we're, humans are very good at judging the world we're in around, based on the circumstances we currently find ourselves in. Um, but I think what we're going to see is that the circumstances are going to change a lot in much shorter time frames than we'd realized. Uh, and that will lead to a big knock-on effect in terms of both how large companies have to operate, but also what appetite small companies have to be created, what spaces they're in, what they're doing, how they're, fun- how they're founded and funded. And I think that, yeah, I think we're at the sort of the thin end of a very massive wedge. For me, this is probably like messing around HTML in 92, if you want, if you want sort of parallel to the digital world. And then what happened after that was enormous. And Amazon was being born probably, I don't know when it was, but you can imagine those firms are kind of beginning to kind of come alive. The same is true of the, have you heard the phrase of gigacorns? They're companies that will take a billion tons of CO2 gas out of the atmosphere per year. They're not, they don't exist yet, but we need them to, mm. really. And I'm not a tech utopian, by the way, but I would love to think that might happen. Mm. Those firms are being born now. We just don't know who they are. Maybe they're on the idea space roster, perhaps. Yeah, there are many amazing companies working yeah. in, in that space. Um, but it's interesting because you've got one thing where you've got new companies and existing companies that are, are making those sorts of changes where their their reason for being is to, to make those changes. And then you've got all the other companies that are just existing in every other sector and space yeah. that, are, yeah. th- that they're the ones that really have to make the change probably to make the most impact. That's right. Um, with, them, with those companies, do you know, who, who we want to engage with sustainability transformation in whatever way they can. Do they, do they actually know what it means? That's a great question. They know what reporting and target setting should look like. And that's where all the energy is going, mm. really. And I'm not a tech utopian, by the way, but I would love to think that might happen. Mm. Those firms are being born now. We just don't know who they are. Maybe they're on the idea space roster, perhaps. Yeah, there are many amazing companies working yeah. in, in that space. Um, but it's interesting because you've got one thing where you've got new companies and existing companies that are, are making those sorts of changes where their their reason for being is to, to make those changes. And then you've got all the other companies that are just existing in every other sector and space yeah. that, are, yeah. th- that they're the ones that really have to make the change probably to make the most impact. That's right. Um, with, them, with those companies, do... You know who who we want to engage with sustainability transformation in whatever way they can. Do they do they actually know what it means? That's a great question. They know what reporting and target setting should look like, and that's where all the energy is going. But if you would you say that the reports that are being generated and the pledges that are being made and the net zero targets that are being set are translating into 
actual on the ground delivery today, very mixed picture. Mm. One of the one of the things that sets us apart, Eden Lab, from, from others, I think, is that we're looking at, okay, so you insert company name here, have set yourself a net zero by 2050 target, and you've got a halfway point by 2030 or whatever. Can I actually buy anything from you that's different to, and that in some way supports that goal? Or is it you've got kind of two elevations or two altitudes of things going on? On the one level, you've got corporate affairs, PR, CEO, city chat, investor relations telling, telling a target story. And then on the ground, if you look at the website, you know, it doesn't actually materialize. It isn't being integrated into daily operations. That's the picture. We built, we built a maturity model. This is the data story I was telling you, where we're able to score firms according to our sense of mm. are they making genuine on the ground operational commercial impact in that sense. And the answer is not not enough yet. Mm. But it, but that's becoming clearer, I think. And again, it's part of this language, sort of linguistic and philosophical barrier between the sustainability people and the commercial people, where they didn't speak the same language. Quite often we're been in situations where we're going to a workshop, less so lately, but where the sustainability person and the kind of chief commercial person haven't actually met, even though they work in the same company. And they might know that there's some goals being set and there's training happening, communication happening, but actually internalizing that and making that part of your deliverable day to day is, is a different thing. What I do find though, is that it's not like companies are full of hordes of people who refuse to engage. I would say it's more that they're full of people who are anxious humans like the rest of us and would like to do something but just don't quite know where to start. Yeah, I was, I was, gonna, I was actually going to say for our <coughs> the, the founders and, and small spin-outs and startups that are at, ad, are at Idea Space, where do they, where do they go? You, you get a sense that everyone wants to do the right thing mm. but they're not entirely sure where they go to find out what they should do but I guess it's Eden Lab and and organisations like yours. Sure, I mean, I'm I'm happy to you know hit me up and we'll we'll talk. But and also it's, not, it's a bit like you know when digital was first arriving, it was all online for you to find out. You just had to start searching, and maybe you had to go and find out that Yahoo Pipes existed as a thing I used to play with and make Twitter bots a thousand years ago. It's not like it's hidden away. Um, but what might not be fired up is your own curiosity, your own preparedness to make time to learn. And mm. I, I think that's the the first thing is go dig and go ask and go look because it's all it's all there it's not really hidden away it is it's hidden in the sense i suppose that there's a lot of jargon and you know kind of confusing language so i did feel like a barrier had been created around it which is not ideal maybe that's the sort of science community not quite finding its way to articulate in mm. you know common english as it were um the other thing really though it's more about a conception of like I, personally, I would say that if, unless you're build it, if you're building a business now, it's your own company and you have you maybe planning to sell it, but even if you're on a five-year time horizon or something, or maybe you're running it for 10 years, if you're not thinking about how that firm will exist in the climate change world that's about to happen, you're not really thinking long-term at all. You're not really, you haven't really got a plan for the viability of your business in the medium term. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we shouldn't care about that. We should just care about this quarter's numbers and you know user user numbers. And but that's not quite what I would invest in if I was in, in private equity or VC. That's a really good point in yeah. terms of um, letting founders know that it's going to affect the value of their company in the in the future. Your that's... earnings ratio presumably is based on our ability to think that you might have a viable business going forward. Mm. I, I find it real. I guess it's my own. You know, you do get. Is my primed experience, my own priming, as it were. But I, I guess it, uh, ad tech's an example I, I know quite well. I suppose. I guess I could be going out there making an amazing piece of um, AI copywriting technology and ad ad performance advertising, as they call it. But doing that in the context of knowing what's coming and not and not being connected to it seems. I don't know. It seems irresponsible and short sighted. And. But maybe you choose your time horizon. Mm. I just think I don't think people think it's a lot further away than it is. That's the main yeah. thing, right? Um, is is greenwashing a real yeah. problem? Yeah, and um, uh, consumers really hoodwinked by by companies thinking that they're helping to solve some sort of crisis. And how, how do the public avoid that? Because it's really hard to yeah. to know, isn't it? And I sort of hope that I wouldn't have to sort of deal with it much. And actually, we are dealing with it a lot, um, and and rightly so. 
a few things. First of all, most people are incredibly cynical about any corporate claim. So there's an awful lot of cynicism in general in society about institutions, let alone companies, right? So a bunch of claims and stories and copywriting that I think has been mainly done through kind of lack of thought or lack of really getting into it. And, and the, the governments in UK and abroad are really clamping down on it at the moment. Right. There's a new code came out and we've been learning about it. And I think it's pretty good because it says you should not mislead people. What that means is you can't show, there's a great example by Lufthansa who sent out an ad with a picture of a plane, top half of the plane fuselage, you know, face on, and the bottom half was the planet. And it was saying something about, frankly, what it was saying is we're trying to buy some new planes and we've probably got some sustainable aviation fuel coming into our fuel mix. But it makes it look like they're a kind of sustainability, they're a sustainable way of flying. And it's just not true. There's no there's no short-term plane solution of any seriousness at scale. Mm. There really, I mean, there really isn't. And we're working on a travel sector project, so we, we know that. That, for me, is greenwashing, and it's misleading people. What you're supposed to do is say, we're doing this, we're trying really hard, but we know it's kind of a small step relative to our overall contribution of emissions, which is X. Right. But let's at least, I think what we're about to see is firms embracing honesty, actually, and yeah. radical transparency around, I could pretend, I could kind of, you know, trick you, and hoodwink you, or maybe we just take it on the chin and we all say, we all know flying's bad. Mm. Let's talk about how bad it is and what we might do about it. In an open way. What what worries me equally is that phrase green hushing. Have you heard green hushing? No. This I also see, which is companies saying there's such a risk of getting a kicking for this stuff. Let's just say nothing. In fact, maybe we do nothing. Like because there's such so, there's such a critique of it that people do nothing. And I think what why that's worrying is imagine if the technology boom of the last twenty years had been predicated on you shall not fail. You know, we talked about failure, about personal failure earlier or whatever. There's a bit of a mantra that it's not okay to fail in this space. I think that's bad. It doesn't lead to, to great learning and great sharing. And so that, where we go from here, I don't know. Maybe better regulation is enough to help us move to a slightly more open conversation. But I think there's a need for quite a fundamental change to come. Mm. Um, we've mentioned um, Carbon 13. You're an advisor for them. Yeah, is just that the main right? expert in the call me. Yeah. Um, and um, they're an accelerator program for, for startups uh, that are helping to, to solve the cli climate emergency that's mm -hmm. um, with us and obviously getting worse mm -hmm. uh, and a move towards that net zero future, if that's, um, if that's the right term. Um, how did you actually get in, involved with them? It's uh, good to give them a, 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 a shout out on the podcast. Yeah, and, and I really like the way they describe what they do. Well, well, I, I said shout out because I'm <laughs> hip, by the way. <laughs> Like it. <laughs> it would appeal to you. all those. <laughs> I think it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> don't they say that anymore? Oh, probably not. <laughs> no, yeah, you're probably, right. probably don't. <laughs> this is all on TikTok, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, because I've done the Cambridge course, and you kind of feel, feel very tuned into the Cambridge system and it, or the ecosystem as you described it, and it is amazing actually seeing it today. I'm glad I came up to see it physically. It's quite, it's quite remarkable. Um, and, and those guys, I think I, I initially I thought it was a Cambridge University kind of offshoot. And I'm, I think it is connected, actually, through um, the Judge Business School as a professor there. Um, and I just was fascinated by the idea of it. That's partly what shaped my mission. They say that they're, the ventures they'll build, the seeds they'll create and then, and then kind of you know, accelerate, have to have the mission of 10 million tonnes of CO2 removal per annum which is huge, you know, I told you mine was five over five years, which is very safe by comparison, but then I wasn't really sure I could come up with a good enough idea. Um, I was so inspired by that, that want, made me want to come and help, really. They're on their fifth cohort at the moment, mm. I think. And I just wrote in and said, you know, kind of be an expert, kind of help you out. Mm, fantastic. Yeah, some amazing um, startups coming out of, uh, yeah. out of there. Yeah, what I like about them as well is that, and it was something which fascinates me, and I've really rekindled this since... Um, it's getting into this is the deep connection to science and technology actually I, i've relearned an incredible awe and fascination for chemistry and biology and physics for example because of the fact and even geography because of the fact that the changes that are needed to the way we operate and think are so fundamental and they're not about narrative design and pr and all that jazz which is yeah, important but it's not as important as figuring out that you might be able to change the way you wash clothes in the detergent which releases CO2 by moving from a chemistry model to a biology one. And I, you know, I don't, GCSE chemistry is as far as I got, I'm afraid, but 
I find that fascinating. And then it seems to me Carbon 13 always brings a stronger technological and science component to it. And I guess idea space the same by being connected to the, to the university. Mm. I went to, I did a talk at the um, Oxford University uh, School of Geography and Environmental Sciences. And I was a student at Oxford and I never went anywhere near that school when I was there. <laughs> to be fair, I didn't go in the computer room and I slept in that building. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> um, but it seems to me that that, and we used to kind of have a bit of a disdain for geographers. I don't know why. It was kind of arrogance and stupidity, looking back on the arts side. Those subjects now are, that is the place to be, man. Like environmental science and geography, mm. chemistry, biology, physics, those things are going to be even more crucial than they were going forward. Because the level of transition that's required on energy, on manufacturing, is just, and food is so enormous. You can't think about how, it's, it's just so vast and it needs really fundamental resets and rethinks. Mm. It's not the same as sharpening up your ad tech. So I feel like so much of the sort of Sil Silicon Valley energy and talent was devoted to making better ads to click on Facebook in the last 20 years. Mm. And those guys are drifting off from that world. And I think driving into something more fundamental and more exciting around what the green, tra the great transition mm. is going to be. So true. Know? And I also like the fact that you, um, I'm going to use another term, bigged up <laughs> my geography degree. So right, for years, well, yeah, so I did. I, and there you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd recommend it to my kids now. I wouldn't recommend advertising, that's for sure. Um, so we're, we're almost um, out of time. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I, just a couple of other small questions. Um, well, not small questions necessarily. I was going to say, what are you most concerned about? It won't all be doom and gloom, but what are you most concerned about? You whether, mean, whether it, for me or climate or... Yeah, maybe, anything, whether it be for you personally or um, in, the, in the work that you... Two things. Okay, yeah. And I do... One is that I, sort of try, I try not to get too frightened and upset about what I... Because I read quite a lot about what's going on and tune into the environmental news and try not to get kind of despondent and into a sort of gloomy despair. You do see people who have kind of moved beyond into a space of like, literally they're about ruggedization as in how you prepare yourself for the end times that are coming. And, and maybe they're right, but I try not to get too pulled into that because I want to get on with stuff today. And my, you know, the other one I worry about, I suppose, is that and I, I'm constantly self-critiquing on this, is that are you sure that using your marketing skills and switching people from buying the dirty high intensity carbon one to the clean low intensity low slavery one is the right thing to do are you sure it's the right thing to do is it true that all business is bad and that we should have no green growth and we just should have degrowth you know there's a big economics argument around that usually at a, a national level rather than a company level um, by the way i've reconciled my way through that which is whether the economy is growing or declining in terms of overall size to reduce you know emissions you need to make sure, we need to make sure that the firms with the right ideas are winning. The firms with the right products and services are taking share at the expense of the dirty ones. So let's do it. If you, yeah. if you invent the smartest, most durable, most compostable regenerative underpants in the world, let's sell them yeah. at the expense yeah. of the ones that aren't. And that, but that's the stuff I sometimes agonize about. Yeah. A bit. And what might you be most optimistic about? Humanity's ingenuity. I'm not a tech utopian. I'm really not. Um, but I suspect that in the face of incredible pressure, some amazing things will happen. Um, some scary things will happen too, but that the that actually we will find a way through. Um, I yeah. hope. It, yeah, I I share that share that sentiment. I think I'm an optimist overall, really. Possibly naively, but I'm not sure how else one can move forward. So that's where I'm at. Um, you're an author, speaker, blogger, activist, etc., uh, amongst other things. How important is the personal brand in, in spreading the message? That's because, interesting, yeah. Um, especially from the perspective maybe as a startup founder. So I, I'd like your advice on this, but I'm, I'm worried that there's too much Leo Raymond, not enough Eden Lab, <laughs> certainly in LinkedIn followers. But how do you divorce the two? I want to build a thing that's bigger than me so that if I get hit by a bus, that the idea that's behind it and the people that are in the team and the associates that we work with it are, carry on. So I do think that it's crucial to kind of build your pure brand in a sense, the brand of the company. 
But no one wants a no one wants to engage and have a drink with a company. They want to have a drink with a person or speak to a person. So finding that balance can be quite interesting. I don't, I'm not sure I've cracked it yet. Um, I, I totally agree about um, what you're saying about having a drink with the company. Mm. It's, it's personality is so incredibly important, and I, I we, we see people unwilling or, or not even just knowing how. What, to put themselves out. To, to put themselves out there. And it, it is important. You know, charisma and character, uh, you know, we, we need those things. We're humans who interact with humans. We're built to yeah. do that. So And you have to, I mean, you have to play to your strengths. If you're a very shy introvert, then possibly, like, splattering yourself all over LinkedIn or whatever your equivalent is might, might not feel comfortable. I guess you've got to be true to yourself. Mm. I, I struggled for a long time in previous jobs to work out what my agenda was and you know, just to talk about things that interested me in general, till I had a mission. When I had that mission, then it was just like, that's what I'm writing about. That's what I'm talking about every time. And it, I never have to rehearse it, really. And it just is. And that was the, that was the really the big differentiator. And, that, and because I think it's urgent, therefore I need to get it out there, even in the face of some criticism. Mm. Um, and the bigger your message gets, the more likely you are to get people quoting biblical passages at you in the comment section, which I had a bit of that stuff, or, you know, on one hand, or kind of critiquing your whole philosophy on the other. Um, but that's them to the break. Because I'd rather that than disappear into silence, really. Mm. And, and on that, are you on social media, or how would people follow you yeah, or I'm find out more about Yeah, definitely LinkedIn, really. I probably should do more than I used to, but... Gave up on Twitter quite a long time ago. Right. So fine. Threads, maybe. Everyone's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. Everyone's given up on LinkedIn. Twitter. is a place where I think there's a good environment for professional conversation. Mm. So okay. that's where I'd be focusing. You can it. find you on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. and, and how do people find out more about um, Eden Lab? You can look at the website, which mm. is edenlab.co, simple as. Um, most of our, we have a newsletter as well, which where we write kind of our latest thinking down, which is good. Um, but LinkedIn is the place really for dialogue and discussion but come and find Leah Raymond and Eden Lab and we'll I'm really open to just exploring conversations people thank you I, I'm sure um, you know based on our our chat today um, uh, you'll yeah. have people awesome. very interested to get in touch I'd love that um, Leah thank you so much really it's appreciate it it's been really really fascinating and um, loved having you uh, on the podcast so thank thanks you. for it cheers for more information or any inquiries about joining Ideaspace, please contact us via ideaspace.cam.ac.uk or via any of our social media channels.